Hi, thanks, Gavin. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm a PhD track candidate at, at Howie. Um, looking at yeah community engagement um, in underwater archaeology in Iceland. And I just thought I'd start by saying that I've kind of gone a roundabout way of ending up where I am now. Um, my background is in ocean science and coastal and marine management. And in my master's thesis, where, which I did at High School of Seto um, I worked with Ragnar Redvidsson, a maritime archaeologist, and ended up looking into the, the management and um, yeah, the management of coastal sites, mostly in the West Fjords, but also for all of Iceland and how the laws and the management are, are affecting coastal sites. And I basically identified this huge gap in, um, in underwater archaeology specifically. And that kind of raised a lot of questions and, and now, yeah, ended up putting forward this, this project for a PhD and this is where I am now. So I'm gonna go into like a bit of the background, um, the challenges, um which i identified previously and then and how community engagement may possibly um be the answer or be an answer um for improved management and so i look at iceland's maritime history not not really but mostly like the sort of romantic view that we have of of, of iceland and um and then the issues in maritime archaeology specifically and then going into the the suggested solutions through in engagement. And yeah, I just like to point out that most of these photos, apart from ones which are very obviously quite tropical, um, are from a 19th century Norwegian whaling station in Alftivjöre, um, not far from me. And so firstly, I, I started a conference presentation with this photo just because I think when people think of Iceland, they think of this sort of these Vikings and these settlers who came by boat and throughout Iceland's history, this has been true. So there's been a very, very high reliance on, on maritime resources and settlers here would have had to have a maritime adaptation firstly to be able to get here, but then also to survive. And there's been proof of um, marine foods even in, in far inland sites. And so throughout the archeology, span even when it's uh, inland, uh, there is proof of a maritime engagement and this is just yeah progressed throughout Iceland's history and, and fishing is obviously not one of the cornerstones of the of the Icelandic economy today and so throughout Iceland's history there's been a heavy reliance on, on maritime resources and looking at the archaeology and and the project which has been done today, it perhaps does not reflect the importance of, of its maritime history. And so the past research on submerged sites specifically, there's, there's more that have been done on maritime sites such as fishing stations and um, elsewhere, but submerged, uh, I, I've been able to <laughs> condense it down to about a half a slide. Um, so we have the work by Einarsson in 1993, which was the first ever submerged uh, survey in Iceland, um, which is perhaps very recent co in comparison with other countries. Um, and this has been followed up by McCarthy and Martin in 2016, 2018, where they went back to the milkmaid um, and did further research, further excavation, and also the 3D mapping and uh, VR, um, yeah, VR, 3D. <laughs> um, and then we have the Kokos medieval trading site in North Iceland. So this was originally um, a terrestrial project, but then some Danish archeologists joined uh, in 2006 and were able to also complete the submerged version. And all that was found there was an anchor and that was taken and preserved. Um, there's very little published on, on the, methods or the results of the underwater work and, and so I wasn't really able to find much information on that. And then we have the work by uh, Ragnar and others uh, in the West Fjords, uh, which was originally to look at the 17th century, but they expanded to the 19th century with Norwegian whaling stations and other whaling stations. Um, and that work is still ongoing, um, but these are the two applications that were that were submitted for actual excavation work. 
And then we have the Phoenix Rec, uh, which was done in 2015. And the Phoenix is one of the only protected sites in Iceland. So you, you cannot visit or, or go there to see. Um, and yeah, excavation work has to be applied for, obviously, um, as well as visiting through Mini Stopman. And so I was looking through Mini Stopman's records. And, um, and as far as I can tell, the, there is eight applications uh, since 1990, and I didn't count out, out of how many applications, but it was it was a lot of pages, and I'm assuming that it was probably thousands. And so the amount of underwater work is is minimal, and there is many challenges and and reasons why this may be, and and the number one is probably because we have a a lacking number of maritime archaeologists who are specializing in maritime archaeology. There is two, to be precise, Kevin Martin and Ragnar Edvardsson. Um, Kevin is currently not working uh, for the Icelandic uh, like archaeology. He's, he's working for the Irish um, Heritage Agency. So there's currently one. Um, and there's only so much work one man can do. And this then leads on to the next challenge, which is there is a complete unknown state of sites. So there's many sites out there that we know about and that we know the exact locations. Others are just uh, approximate locations due to from historical records. Um, and so all of these need to be found and surveyed um, to be able to get a, comp like a baseline of, of the state of sites as they are now. And Without that, it's very, very difficult to monitor sites, um, to put suggestions forward if there's going to be construction, um, to do anything, basically. And so Ragnar's got a very long list of, of jobs to do, um, and it's probably not possible within his working lifetime. Um, and I've linked this to perhaps education. So. There is not a maritime archaeology course offered at the University of Iceland. And previously there has been sort of extra courses offered, um, but there's not a specific um, dedication to maritime archaeology. And I'm trying to figure out why that is, um, or like why perhaps people aren't interested in maritime archaeology as much as the settlement history. Um, and so if somebody is, they would then have to leave the country and go study elsewhere. And the likelihood of them coming back to, to work on their own is probably minimum. And then funding, as with all archeology span humanities, um, funding is always an issue, but when you take the work underwater, the, the, the amount of funding you need increases exponentially. Um, everything's more expensive. You have a lot less time. You, you have a limited amount of air to be able to get the work done. And so it takes a lot longer and a lot more money. And so overall, there's this marginalization of maritime archaeology compared with terrestrial in, in Iceland. And so I was wanted to make sure that the background laws um, covering submerged sites are adequate. And if, if there's a problem within the laws and if sites are more at risk, it, that needs to be addressed first before before people start going to these sites more often you know so i look through the laws basically yes they are they cover everything they're very simple to follow um and everything is covered within the heritage act and it's simple all archaeological sites over 100 years um this includes submerged sites which was added in i believe 82 um, previously, there wasn't really like a specific mention of, of submerged sites, um, but they've uh, yeah, increased the law, just made it a lot more simple and to understand. And the all ships before 1950, uh, wrecked or still going, um, are protected. Um, and just to note that Iceland has not ratified the 2001 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. Um, I'm trying to find out the exact wording for why. Um, and I hope to do that sometime within this PhD, but basically there is a link to, to fishing. And so if there's any issues which come up within the uh, convention, which might relate to the restrictions of fishing, 
obviously Iceland's a little bit um, hesitant. And I hope to find the exact wording that was used um, for the reasoning to not ratify. And so all of these challenges and all of these issues sort of led me to thinking about if public or community archaeology could, could answer some of these or could help um, towards having better monitoring of underwater sites. And so it's a subdiscipline within archaeology whereby the community is given control of various aspects. And this can be varying levels depending on the project, but um, community archaeology is usually, the community is involved throughout. And UNESCO specifically state that community engagement it has proven to be successful with um, increasing protection for underwater sites. And there is many, they all really love their acronyms, obviously, um, but there's many organizations around the world that have done this and have proven that it works in order to further protection and to help with the monitoring of sites. So there's the probably most famous one that perhaps you all know about is the NAS, which is the Nautical Archaeological Society. They run the journal, the International Journal of Nautical Archaeology as well. And this is a very successful program. So they have 26 training partners around the world. Uh, they've qualified thousands and thousands of avocational archeologist divers. Um, and they have gone towards letting people adopt wrecks and monitor and they can join archeologists on sites. Basically they sort of give them a, when they're fully trained, they give them a passport and then they're able to, to come onto sites um, and help archeologists because they know what they're doing. Uh, we have the Florida Public Archaeology Network, um, GERT, which is the gathering of information via recreational and technical divers. Uh, we have UASBC, which is the Underwater Archaeological Society of British Columbia. Uh, NOAA, which has their own um, archaeological program. And then we have the United States National Park Service. Um, they also have their own underwater archaeological program. And this is just a selection of, of a few. There is there is a lot, a lot more out there um, that have had complete success stories. And so this is all centered around the heritage cycle, which was designed in Thurley in 2005, um, that by understanding people value it more and if they value it, they care for it. And if they care for it, they enjoy it by understanding. And it's just continuous. So basically the more that the public are involved the more they've been proven to be able to help. And this is perhaps maybe a backwards way of thinking and a, definitely a backwards way of how they used to teach archeology span like years and years ago, where the public were probably kept at arm's length because they thought that if they knew everything about a site and knew where it was and, and how to get to it, that that would increase looting and, and theft from sites. But now I think, it's starting to come around that archaeologists are realizing that the more people are involved, the more people care about the site. And if somebody cares about a site, then they will do, do their best to also protect it because they want it to be there for, for their own children. And so this leads on to, to my work and, and the plan of how it's going. So I'm just finishing my first full time year now. Um, and so I've finish the literature review and methodology development and then moving on to work package two, which is all about collaboration and pilot study. And I basically, the main aim was for me to, to find out what value does underwater archaeology hold to the varying stakeholders, um, which I'll go into, and then to design a pilot study, which teaches very basic in situ, non-invasive surveying. Um, and this is designed around the NAS um, training and also with help from uh, Della Scott Irriton from Florida, who also runs a program there, and Andy Viduka in Australia, who runs a GERT program. And so I have some incredible people helping um, and collaborating with me on, on designing this program. And basically, we want to get the divers out and and give them an idea of, of how to survey. Um, and then 
after all of this, how to quantify the success, if it worked, if, if this is likely to work in the future and if it solved any of the issues. And that's a very difficult task to look at when considering the project. So I'm not gonna have numbers at the end of this, which is perhaps what I'm more used to, but it's gonna be based on people's opinions um, survey results, did we produce a good enough um, site sketch um, that could be used by mini Sovereign perhaps uh, to monitor sites and also participation rates. So right now, obviously people are just getting involved, um, but it'd be really interesting to see towards the end if they're still involved and if they're still excited by this. And my main goal throughout the pilot study was to turn it from public archaeology into community archaeology. So there's a lot of definitions out there and, and you can find a different definition with basically every, every paper that you read. But the definitions that I'm using is basically public archaeology is quite a top down approach. So I'm the one sort of setting this up. I'm getting the community involved. I'm speaking to archaeologists and, and I'm suggesting sites that we go to. Um, and I really want to turn that into the community feeling more involved and also feeling more confident in this in themselves to be able to say oh I there's a shipwreck near me I would like to go survey it would anyone like to come with me um and basically the ideal end to this would be for me to take myself out of this and the project to still be continuing um and so right now I'm acting as a facilitator between archaeologists and between the community um, but the real goal should be that there is communication and collaboration between, between both groups and that it's a good collaboration and both groups can get something out of this. And so the stakeholders involved that I'm considering, obviously, as a community, the archaeologists and also mini Sumnan. So yes, I know like mini Sumnan are archaeologists, but they're also the the heritage agency and and they're the ones making the rules and obviously we need to make sure that everything is being done by the rules um but also that it's going to benefit and looking then into work package three which will be hopefully next year how to make this project sustainable and how to make it benefit the heritage agency as well as um, the community and if the community can produce results that help to monitor sites um that's also going to help me use them because i i'm sure that you can probably work out with only one uh sort of currently qualified underwater archaeologist with any construction work that's going to come up mini something are under huge strain um and they've been able to sort of do it so far with remote sensing data so either uh, multi-beam or side scan sonar um, they're able to sort of look at sites and see if there's anything that needs further investigation uh, by divers. And so far, that hasn't really been needed apart from a couple of sites. But there's a potential road being built that could go over the top of many shipwrecks just outside of Reykjavik, like in front of Ezio. Um, and there is just absolutely no way that that is able to be completely surveyed with only remote sensing data. And so they're gonna to have to send divers down and who would those divers be? And so unless we can have this sort of group of people who are trained, who can assist an archeologist, um, they're gonna to have to bring in outside outside um, people from, from another country. And I think mini Sognan are very, very aware that they're about to be under huge strain. Um, but they have a lot of other things that they do have to deal with as well. And so one of the first questions I needed to answer was, is the community interested? So it's all good and well, me putting this project forward and getting all excited about having the community interested if they're then not, and that there's nobody to work with. And so I sent out a survey last year um, to basically gather people's opinions on the value of archeology, span the knowledge of sites that they know about already. Do they have any interest in this? And also some demographic information. And I was able to get 93 respondents, all who are qualified divers living within Iceland. And basically, I asked them quite a few questions, um, but 
one I've selected a few just to highlight. Um, and do you feel like underwater archaeological sites in Iceland hold any value? And so, yes, obviously they they agree that it holds huge educational value and then going all the way down to political value, which is not so much and monetary value. And that was really important to see because obviously people need to know why these sites should be protected and why they shouldn't be looted or uh, disrupted. Um, are they aware of underwater archaeological sites? And the majority were said no. Um, and of the ones who said yes, quite a lot said uh, the milkmaid. And that is, I think I can put that down to the fact that um, Kevin Martin and, and John McCarthy's work in 2016 to 2018 uh, went viral with the with the uh, virtual reality tour of the wreck and that went viral internationally as well as within Iceland and so a lot of people were aware of this site and listed that one in particular um, and another site which people quite often knew about was El Guilo um, in say this field and maybe that's because they dived it or maybe it's because of the ongoing news story with the oil leak um, um, but not really anything else. Um, basically, are they interested in any of these? So are they interested in preservation for future generations? So yes. Um, the, the least interested was the promotion for economic benefit, which I found interesting uh, and also good that people are not looking to just... Uh, make money from dive sites obviously some said yes but um yeah it's definitely the least least selected option and increasing awareness and uh, diving on heritage awareness costs and basically the last question which sort of tied into my phd and if people are interested in would they want to do this um is if they would be interested in the possibility to adopt a site um, and to monitor that site annually for damages or changes. And overwhelmingly, the answer was yes. Some said maybe, and some said they need more information about what training and how to do it and things like that. But overwhelmingly, it was a very positive answer. And so I felt more confident in going ahead with this PhD generally. Um, and through this, I then set up um, a social media platform as, and as I'm sure you're all aware, Facebook is heavily used in Iceland and is probably the easiest way to get in touch with people. And uh, from there, I offered the first training session. And on the entrance to be in the group, ask a question about, do you have any experience or, or why are you interested in being involved? And the community are basically incredible. So that we have some archaeologists, we have in like very experienced divers um, and dive instructors. Um, we have a guy with shipwreck and remote sensing experience, uh, boat owners, hyperbaric chamber operators, and the rest are filled of, with divers who want to dive with a purpose, which is, is where I would class myself in this, um, in this category as well. So I'm, I'm really bad at just diving around and looking at fish. And I would much prefer to be doing some work whilst I'm down there. And so this lovely photo is from the first heritage awareness course that, that I ran. And that was ran by Della, who is one of my committee members um, in association with FPAN, the Florida Public Archaeological Network. And we had nine participants, uh, three of whom are diving instructors. And this course basically then allows them to teach heritage awareness to, to new divers. And this is really important because basically we want to start at the bottom. So these new divers who are coming through, if they're being taught about heritage awareness, they will always be heritage aware. You know, if this is something that's in their very basic training. Um, and this is also something to consider that this isn't offered already and is an extra. Um, and Paddy and Bezak and all of these other diving bodies do not require any um, any talk about heritage sites or diving on heritage sites and what not and what to do. And 
they do have some requirement on ecosystems and biology. So this is, I mean, I'm not going to be start going into trying to change the, the rules of how to qualify as a diver, but it's it's up there with the issues that are in the um, diving education as well. And so three of these are now, yeah, they're diving instructors with the knowledge and with the teaching materials to be able to go into heritage awareness for any new divers in Iceland as well. So really wanting to start from the bottom and, and work our way up to, to all divers and anyone who's getting in the water around Iceland, that they know what they're doing and that they know what not to do, which is perhaps more important. And so we, I talk about the community and these divers, but when you actually look at the skills that they bring um, and could bring to, to maritime archaeology, it's really impressive. And the skills, yeah, as a diver, it would take, obviously, obvi so it's better to teach archaeologists to dive than to teach archaeology to divers. It's much easier. You're all obviously doing degrees or have done degrees and you understand how difficult it is. Um, but when we're lacking the professionals, this is probably the next best, best thing of, of having um, people who know what they're doing underwater and, and can control themselves um, to be able to help with the service. And so my next step and where I am now is, is moving on to uh, the archaeologists and the archaeology stakeholders. And so I currently have um, a survey out and it's only been out for a couple of weeks, but I would really like a lot more respondents if possible. So if you haven't, I'll use this opportunity to, to ask you very nicely to, to fill in the survey for me. Because um, I'm really interested in how archaeologists feel about community archaeology. And so, so far I've got 15 responses. Um, and yes, as I say, it's not been out that long, but it is very helpful um, to be able to match the community with the archaeologists. And there is varying views of community archaeology. Um, and I know that it can be quite, um, yeah, uh, a conflict of interest perhaps, and that there is some, yeah, strong views about uh, why we sh shouldn't perhaps be involved in the community and everything that we do. Um, and so I'd really like to be able to figure out what the issues are and so that we can resolve them or come up with some solution before they, yeah, before they really cause any problems. And so the one of the first questions I ask is, is community archaeology important? And, and quite a lot of people say that they strongly agree um, that community archaeology is an important aspect in the archaeology profession. And I also agree with this. So it's really important because archaeology is about people's heritage. And it's usually about the people's heritage who live there, who grew up there, or their ancestors. If you're talking about maritime archaeology and a shipwreck, you also have the the history and the ancestors of people around the world because ships are obviously moving objects they've come from somewhere and so you have to respect all of the, these people's sort of wishes and and that quite a lot of people are really interested in in what happened and and where it ended up and um wanting to know more and so it's really important that i think archaeologists are are involving the community, but that's obviously not how everyone feels. And I can sort of see this more with the next couple of questions where it's a little bit querying. And so that projects should always be designed and led by an archeologist, even if they do not involve invasive surveying. And this is obviously strongly agree. And I put, there was no context to these questions. And so perhaps, this is highlighting to me that I need to explain myself further and I need to explain my project further um, because I'm not an archaeologist and I'm sort of going ahead with this. Um, and I, yeah, really would like it to be a collaboration of everyone. And the second one is also sort of related to this, that trained community members should be directly supervised by an archaeologist. And 
I think on quite a lot of community uh, community awareness projects and and things that have been done in Iceland thus far. Um, there's a couple of examples that have used or have involved the community throughout, but usually it's more of a top down approach or public archaeology where um, there's more of a presentation of results or a presentation of finds or things like this. And so it's going to take like a, an idea shift of what community archaeology is um, and getting the community more involved um, throughout and not just towards the end. And so this obviously is a very, very recent survey and very preliminary results, but I would, um, yeah, I'm really excited to see what happens and, and what comes of this and also to see the, the future collaboration and if it's possible or if I'm gonna be writing in my PhD that it's not possible. And I'm sure that will also give me a lot to write about, um, but obviously I hope not. So this is, yeah, this is everything I had. And I believe that only through collaboration will Iceland achieve its full potential in underwater archeology. span Yes, thank you very much. Thank